In lesson two, we are continuing to learn about computer hardware. We're going to talk about data storage, peripherals, and power protection. Data storage. Now to talk about external data storage, which is storing files outside your computer to transport them somewhere else, let's take a little walk down memory lane. I'm going to start with the mighty floppy disk. Yes, I know there are older technologies like cassette tape drives. Yes, I had one of those. And even punch cards, if you're older than me. But when PC started to become popular, when most people started buying computers for home use, they came with floppy disk drives. Now, most computers sold today in 2023 don't come with floppy disk drives. In fact, you might not even have a CD or a DV drive in your computer. But you might come across some older PCs that still have them. They are still in use. Just 10 to 15 years ago, most computers still came with a three and a half inch floppy drive. Floppy disks only store about a couple of megabytes of data, so that's not a lot. And even those newer three and a half inch disks that are made of hard plastic, those are still called floppy disks, not hard disks. The hard disk is inside your computer, remember that. Right, this guy's got that hard plastic shell, so everyone thinks that's a hard disk. No, they're talking about the little floppy piece of magnetic film that's inside all of these disks. There's one inside here too, right? That's what's called the floppy disk. The case that it's in doesn't really make a difference, right? And also, make sure you keep these guys away from magnets too, okay? They're based on magnetic film, and if you get a magnet too close to them, you will erase them. In fact, they used to sell a bulk eraser that you could just erase all your disks in one shot. Now, because they don't have a lot of storage space, they can only really hold a couple of documents or a small program, maybe a couple of pictures. That's about it. I remember installing Windows 95 when it came on 13 floppy disks. Talk about a long install. You have to sit there and wait and wait and wait. Okay, insert disk two, and then you wait, and then you wait. <laughs> So even though floppy disks are an outdated storage medium, like I said, they've been around since the 70s. You'll be hard pressed to find one in the wild today, but you might still come across one. Especially if you go over to grandma's house and she's got the old IBM PC in the closet, right? <laughs> okay, now after floppy disks, we started getting CD-ROM disks, which contained a lot more information, up to 650 megabytes. So that's hundreds of floppy disks would fit on one CD. And that allowed us to put Windows 95, for example, on just one CD. And everyone was amazed and things installed a lot faster. And that was great. Now, originally, CDs were read-only. You could only read information off them. They had to be professionally printed at the CD printing company, right? You couldn't write data back to them. But then, a few years after the CDs came out, we started getting rewritables where you could, at first, you could write once to it. You could buy something called a CD burner. Once you burn data on the disk, though, that was it. It was done. A few years later, we started getting rewritables where you can erase the disc and put more stuff on it. And then the same thing happened with DVDs. And DVDs got even bigger, right? We could get up to 17 gigabytes. So billions of bytes of information on one disc at about the same size. And the same thing happened. First, they started off read-only, and then you could erase them and write back to them once and blah, 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 blah. Now, most modern computers today that I've seen don't even come with a CD or DVD drive. Um, I did buy a laptop a couple of years ago that came with an external DVD player just in case you had a DVD you wanted to install something or watch a movie or whatever. Um, but most of the time now, it's an optional accessory. You will still see these, but a lot of times computers that are being sold, especially laptops, don't even come with them. So if you have DVDs or CDs at home that you need to be able to read and write, make sure your new computer does come with a drive for it. If not, you can get an external drive. Most of the shift away from built-in drives and even external drives is because of the prevalence of high-speed internet connectivity. With most computers now connected to the internet, transferring files electronically, streaming media, all that has become the norm, which basically gets rid of the need to store data on disks. But it's still good to have an understanding of what all these things are and where they came from and why they were important. If you do need to transfer files physically, Today, the most common form of external drive storage is the USB flash drive, also known as a thumb drive or a pen drive. These offer portability with various storage capacities ranging from a few gigabytes to several terabytes. 
They're plug and play devices, which means you just plug them into your computer in the USB drive port and they just work. You don't have to install any special software. These drives are fast. They're much faster than floppies or DVDs. Some of them will even work across multiple operating systems. They're ideal for file sharing, for backups, keeping your important files backed up so it's not just on your computer, right? You can carry important data wherever you go. Some models even include built-in security features like encryption or password protection. I've seen thumb drives with literal thumbprint readers on them. So you had to put your, your fingerprint on it for it to work. So all kinds of different things you can do with flash drives now. Now we're done walking down memory lane. Fast forward to 2023. That's today. A lot of people, including myself, store their files on the cloud. Now, cloud storage represents a revolutionary shift in how we manage and access our data. Unlike traditional physical storage devices, cloud storage allows us to securely store our files and information on remote servers accessible through the internet. With cloud storage, we are no longer bound by the limitations of local storage capacity. So you don't have to worry about filling up your hard drive. Instead, you just pay for more. We have virtually unlimited space to store and organize our photos, videos, documents, all that stuff. Cloud storage also gives you seamless access to your files from multiple devices. You could get your files from a computer, a smartphone, a tablet, mom's house, wherever you happen to be. Automatic synchronization ensures that changes made on one device reflect across all connected devices instantly. I personally love using Google Drive. So if I'm working on my office computer and I save some some changes to a document. Later on, I could be on my phone somewhere else and, and open up that same exact document right on the cloud. Now, now this is something I hear a lot. The cloud doesn't represent some magical place out there in the internet someplace, right? It's just simply someone else's computer where your files are being stored. Or in this case, it's a company's data center where you store your information. It's massive data server farms with lots and lots and lots of computers on them. There are three big players today. There's Google Drive, that's the one I use, Dropbox, and Microsoft's OneDrive. There are a lot of other companies too, like Amazon, IBM. I like the convenience of cloud storage, but always make sure you've got your critical files backed up on a trusted local device too. Right? Even get yourself a thumb drive. They're cheap. Right? Put all your important stuff on a thumb drive and put it in your safe. Okay. Yes, I love cloud storage, but I would never rely on it 100%. Moving on to peripherals. Peripherals are any device that plug into the computer. For example, your monitor. This is your computer's screen. Now, back when I first recorded this class in 2002, CRT monitors were the norm. Cathode ray tube. Remember big old tube style TVs, right? And your grandma used to yell at you not to sit too close to it or you'd go blind. Anybody remember those? I had a couple of 21-inch CRT monitors on my desk when I was younger, and I thought I was the boss, right? <laughs> well, now again, flash forward to 2023, and you won't find those CRTs anywhere. Now it's all LCD monitors, liquid crystal display, or LED, right? Light-emitting diodes. They typically range in sizes from 22 to 24 inches. That's about the average for a business computer. You'll find ultra-wide gaming monitors, for people like me who would rather have one big monitor instead of four small ones like I used to have. And now, of course, a lot of big monitors are curved, which makes it easier to see the sides. Next up is the universally most hated peripheral in all of computerdom. The printer causes the most problems. There are three main types of printers commonly used today. You've got inkjet printers, which are generally the cheapest option. They can print both black and white and color. The cost per page tends to be higher due to the relatively expensive cost of ink cartridges. Laser printers, on the other hand, have a higher upfront cost to buy the machine, but the cost per page for printing is lower because the toner is cheaper. That makes them more economical for companies or families that do a lot of high volume printing. And finally, we have thermal printers, which are compact and portable, making them great for travel. However, they also require special paper with heat-sensitive coating for printing. So the cost per printing can be pretty high for those. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention dot matrix printers. Remember these guys? Yes, they still exist. You might come across them with companies that need to produce multi-part forms where you can print it out and sign it with carbon paper. Remember that stuff? 
My first printer was a dot matrix printer, and I'll never forget my mother waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning screaming at me because it made that awful noise throughout the entire house when I printed off my homework for the next day. And, of course, I had the English teacher who refused to accept printed homework because he didn't like the way that dot matrix printing looked. So, I couldn't win. A lot of people, of course, have a love-hate relationship with printers. Why does it say paper jam when there is no paper jam? What is PC load letter? So, yeah. Love them or hate them. <laughs> now, on the other side of printers, you got scanners. And scanners allow you to take the printed page and turn it into a digital file that you can store and work with on the computer. Now, in the past, standalone scanners were common, but nowadays you'll often find scanners integrated into printers, specifically inkjet printers. In fact, many modern smartphones have cameras that are high quality enough that you can effectively scan a page and send it directly to your email. This is what I do all the time. If you've only got one or two pages, like a receipt or an invoice that you want to save digitally, just take a picture of it with your smartphone. No need to buy a big scanner. However, if you do lots and lots of scanning, like 100-page documents, you can buy a sheet-fed scanner where you can put a whole stack of paper on it and it'll just scan it through one page at a time and create a file out of it for you. So, there you go. If you enjoy video conferencing, recording yourself, or creating content for platforms like YouTube like I do, there's a wide range of video cameras, also known as webcams, available for your PC. You can find webcams that clip onto the back of your monitor, or ones on tripods for added flexibility. With the variety of options available, webcams can cater to diverse needs. Nowadays, most laptops come with a built-in webcam, and to address privacy concerns, many laptops have a small slider that allows you to cover the camera when not in use. For laptops without those built-in sliders, you can purchase a little webcam cover online. They provide a neat little effective privacy solution. I used to have a laptop that didn't have that, and I used to put a piece of tape on it. They got little sliders you can get now. If you're into gaming, the world of joysticks offers an abundance of options. Whether you want to experience flying a plane, navigating a maze, or enjoying classic gaming like Pac-Man, there's a joystick designed for it. Remarkably, some manufacturers have even recreated the iconic Atari 2600-style joystick from the 70s. Remember that guy? This was my first joystick right here. <laughs> Other peripherals include speakers and microphones. While most laptops come with built-in speakers and microphones, for desktop systems, you may need to add them separately. There's a wide range of speaker options available, from basic desktop speakers to premium ones like the Bose Super Bass Monster speakers. Headsets are popular, especially for late-night gamers who don't want to wake up mom at 3 a.m. like I used to do. Headsets provide a private audio experience while enabling clear communication with teammates during gaming sessions or virtual meetings. For desktop recording purposes like my setup, you can use a dedicated microphone. I've got this guy right there, but I got a boom mic stand for it so I could put it off to the side, like next to my face while I'm recording. I actually did a whole set of videos on my YouTube channel to ask all my users which one they thought sounded the best. And that toner mic is the one that won, so yay. Another type of peripheral is the network adapter, which allows you to connect to your office network or the internet. You sometimes have the option of either a wired connection, which is commonly used in businesses, or a wireless connection on the home or office Wi-Fi. Wired connections generally offer faster speeds and better security, but with wireless connection, you have the freedom to move around without being tethered to a cable. Nowadays, most laptops come with built-in wireless networking capabilities. Higher-end laptops often have a wired network port, which is my preferred choice. For desktop PCs, you may need to acquire a network adapter, which can either be in the form of an expansion card that you plug in or a USB adapter that plugs into a USB port. Now, here's a blast from the past. <laughs> Some computers still have modems which is a device that lets you connect your computer to a telephone line. I'm just kidding with these two. This is, this is a joke. These are really old modems, and you probably will never see these again in your life. This one here is called an acoustic coupler, and you literally would take your phone, you'd dial the phone, and then you'd set it down on this thing, and it would connect to whoever you were connecting to, an, an, another computer or a, a bulletin board system or those things. Remember the movie War Games? <laughs> he had one of those. 
This little guy down here was my first actual modem. It was a 300 baud modem from Radio Shack for my TRS-80 color computer. This is what modems look like today, even if you even see one around. Um, some computers still use them. Modems were widely used in the past for dial-up internet access before broadband became uh, popular. Some computer systems still use these for sending faxes. So if you still send, I know a lot of medical offices and legal offices still send faxes. So 1990s, but it's, it, they're still used. And of course, there are services available online to where you can send and receive faxes without needing a modem. So it, it makes them completely moot. One essential aspect of computing that many people overlook is proper power protection for their computer. Now, when dealing with a desktop PC, investing in a high quality surge protector rated specifically for computers is crucial. Avoid using that cheap off the shelf power strip that you get from the hardware store. All right, they're not properly rated for surges to protect computers against power fluctuations, spikes, brownouts, that kind of stuff. Now, additionally, if you want to ensure data protection in the event of a power outage, I strongly recommend getting yourself an uninterruptible power supply or UPS. A UPS basically acts as a large battery that connects your computer to the wall outlet. So you plug your computer into the UPS, you plug your UPS into the power, and if the power goes out, or if there's a spike or any kind of brownout or whatever, the battery kicks in immediately and it continues to feed power to your computer. Depending on the size of your UPS, it can run your computer for anywhere from a few minutes to several hours. Essentially, it gives you time to save your work and shut the computer down properly in the case that the power goes out. I also use a UPS box like this on my TV at home because I live here in Southwest Florida and all summer long we get thunderstorms and the power goes off for five seconds. So not only could that damage my TV, but it also shuts everything off and then the, you know, the TV's got to restart, the cable box has to reboot, all that stuff. So a UPS, they're not that expensive and you can use them to protect all the expensive equipment in your house. Plus, you know, when I'm watching Star Trek, I, don't don't interrupt me, man. Just leave, just no, just if the power goes out, I, I, I lose it. 